afternoon and uh, welcome to the third uh, event of Taylor Chair in Philosophy. And uh, my name is Robin Wong, and uh, I'm a current uh, Taylor Chair holder. So this Taylor Chair event is a part of a project called Dao and uh, Ignatian Spirituality. So this project is uh, um, explore the connections between Ignatian spiritual spirituality and the Asian spiritualities, especially uh, Taoism. So this event um, is also co-sponsored with Academy of Catholic Thought and the Imagination and Alamios Center for Ignatian Spirituality. So um, thank you for all your support. And also Amila over the back, and uh, she did a lot of works to bring your, you know, uh, set up all specifics, and also Alexis, our philosophy department. So thank you for all the uh, support. Um, Pythagoras, a, a 500 BC Greek philosopher, once claimed that the mind is not a vessel to be filled, it is a fire um, to be kindled. So today, we gather together to uh, ignite fire in our mind with three questions, okay? What, why, and how? So here's the question. What does Ignatian tradition have to, uh, have to offer those from a different religious background and the traditions? So this is a question one, what? Secondly, why? Why Ignatian prayer, meditation, and the contemplation should be adopted for members of other religions? Second, okay. Third, how? How the Ignatian spiritual exercise might be made accessible to those from another traditions? So this is the three basic questions. However, this is a question, it's not from me, it's from our distinguished speaker. So today we have um, distinguished speak, speaker and give me great pleasure and a privilege introduce to our uh, speaker, Dr. Erin Klein. Okay. She is a professor of theology at the Georgetown University. But now I need to make a, a correction. So when we planning for this event last year, she was associate professor. So you can see all the flyers that associate professor, but she is newly promoted to full professor of theology. <laughs> so what a accomplishment. And she teaches in the Department of Theology, Philosophy, and Asian study, Asian studies. She's also a faculty fellow in Berkeley Center for Religion, uh, Peace, and the World Affairs. She's the author of three books and more than 20 research articles on Chinese philosophy, comparative philosophy and the religion, and the Ignatian spirituality. I think the more a, a great accomplishment, you know, she just published the new book. It's called A World on Fire, so that today we talk about the fire, fire in our mind as well. And sharing the Ignatian spiritual exercise with another tradition. It's published by Catholic University of American Press. It just published uh, a last year. So this book is a wonderful kind. It's the only book I know to date actually make a connection between Ignatian spirituality and another religious tradition, particularly Asian spirituality. So this is very unique. Plus, on the personal level, I also want to add one more thing. Uh, Professor Klein is really a role model for a woman because she has three young children. Right? She's a mother of three young children, so third grade, second grade, and three years old. At the same time, 
she accomplished professionally. So this is very impressive. Okay, um, please join me to welcome uh, Professor Eric Clark. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to push this forward just a little bit. Can you help me so that I can see the screen? <coughs> Thank you. That's perfect. So, um, oh, just one small note. Um, Professor Aaron Klein will be talk about 45 to one hour, and then we open to uh, questions about 45 minutes. I know some students really you need to go to class, and uh, it's okay. you know, so you can go. One after <laughs> You'll be relieved to escape, right? <laughs> so. Um, the most influential text in the Confucian tradition, the Analects, begins with a well-known and beloved line. Yo peng zi yuan feng lai bu yi le hu. Is it not a joy to have friends come from afar? But perhaps there's another lost saying of Confucius that would be more appropriate in my case today. Zi yuan feng lai yi jian peng you bu yi le hu. Is it not a joy to come from afar to visit friends? It is a great joy and honor for me to have come from afar and be offered the opportunity to visit with so many friends and colleagues, both old and new. And I'd like to take a moment to thank those who have made my visit possible. First and foremost, I express my gratitude to Professor Robin Wong for proposing and planning and working to bring to fruition this event. I also thank Emily Reyes for her organizational work and for her help in facilitating my visit. And I also want to thank Alexis Dolan for everything that she's done um, to make my talk and my visit possible. I'd especially like to thank the Robert Taylor SJ Chair in Philosophy, the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination, and the Center for Ignatian Spirituality at LMU for supporting this event. Three years ago, Pope Francis stood alongside Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, and Christian religious leaders in an underground chamber at the 9-11 memorial where the victims of the World Trade Center attacks are memorialized. In one of the most memorable scenes from his historic US visit, each one offered prayers or meditations first in their, their own sacred languages, then in English, and Pope Francis called on the religious leaders who surrounded him to be a force for reconciliation. In opposing every attempt to create a rigid uniformity, we can and must build unity on the basis of our diversity of languages, cultures, and religions, and lift our voices against everything which would stand in the way of such unity. How timely his words are for us today. Not only are the ideals that Pope Francis articulates hallmarks of the Jesuit order, recently Jesuits have begun to recognize that Ignatian spirituality might be an instrument for peace and healing that can reach beyond the boundaries of religious traditions. In 2009, Father Adolfo Nicholas, then Superior General of the Jesuits, made a series of remarks about the need to share the Ignatian spiritual exercises with non-Christians. I'm especially excited to be at Loyola Marymount University because this is where he actually made those remarks. <coughs> and this is what he said. While the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola are radically Christocentric, centered on the core notion of discipleship and the kingdom of God, Experience and the testimony of non-Christians suggests that important elements of the spiritual exercises, especially those concerned with spiritual freedom, equipoise and discernment, can be fruitfully appropriated even by non-Christians. I would like to underline this idea that the spiritual exercises can be shared by non-Christians. Even though Christ is at the heart of the full experience of the exercises, it is also true that their structure involves a process of liberation of opening to new horizons that can benefit people who do not share our life of faith. This is something I'd like to see explored more and more. We particularly experienced this challenge in Japan when non-Christians came to visit and asked if they could make the exercises. This triggered a reflection, and it's one that we need to continue. What are the dynamics in the exercises that non-believers might make their own to find wider horizons in life, a greater sense of spiritual freedom? Now, as he indicates, Father Nicholas was no stranger to the challenges involved in what he proposed. He taught systematic theology for more than 30 years in Japan and served as provincial before becoming the moderator of the Jesuit Conference for East Asia. 
But his remarks led to considerable debate in Jesuit circles concerning, first, what exactly he was proposing, and second, how exactly one might go about sharing the Ignatian spiritual exercises with non-Christians. Could Ignatian spirituality possibly serve as a resource for larger numbers of people in the way that other spiritual practices have in recent years? The popularity of yoga and Buddhist meditation are two examples of spiritual practices that have gone mainstream. Yet these practices have their origins in particular religious traditions, in which they have particular spiritual aims and purposes. There has been considerable debate about the secularization of these practices, which has been central to their success in the mainstream. So could the exercises be adapted for non-Christians in the way that these practices have been adapted? Put another way, can Christian spiritual practices serve non-Christians, just as Hindu and Buddhist spiritual practices serve non-Hindus and non-Buddhists? How would they have to be changed in order to make them accessible and beneficial for non-Christians? And would such changes be advisable? In my book, I focus on a particular subset of non-Christians, those who are members of other religious traditions or who identify closely with other religious traditions. And I explore two different ways in which members of other religions might benefit from the spiritual exercises. The first is the adaptation of the full and complete exercises for members of other religions. The second involves creating new spiritual exercises that draw inspiration from the Ignatian tradition. While my argument applies to all other religions, I present case studies from Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. I also discuss the Taoist tradition. Partly because in these traditions, one finds some of the hardest cases of adaptation that I think one will encounter in adapting the exercises. I argue that the exercises can and should be adapted for members of other religions, but I argue that this should be done carefully in order to maintain the integrity and effectiveness of the exercises. I don't think that the task of adaptation typically involves removing large parts of the exercises. I also think in many cases that people should be sent back to their own religious traditions and to the rich contemplative practices that are part of those traditions in order to find the best match for their needs. As many of you know, the Ignatian spiritual exercises get their name from Ignatius' belief that like the body, the human spirit requires exercise in order to stay healthy. And this is what Ignatius says. He compares spiritual exercises to different forms of physical exercises. And in his description of this, he also highlights what some of the aims of the exercises are. Spiritual exercises given to any means of preparing and disposing a soul to rid itself of all its disordered affections. And then after their removal of seeking and finding God's will in the ordering of our life for the salvation of our soul. These different ways of praying and meditating and reading scripture give shape to the spiritual lives of Jesuits and many others. They offer a way of learning to recognize God's ongoing presence in one's life and work and of deepening one's relationship with God. Two especially distinctive ways of praying that are taught in the exercises are meditation and contemplation. And this is Ignatian terminology here. So it's a slightly different understanding of meditation than some of you might be familiar with. Ignatian meditation involves using our intellect to wrestle with basic principles that guide our life. We pray over images and ideas proposed by Ignatius and engage our memory to appreciate the activity of God in our lives. A number of meditations in the exercises involve considering how different it is to follow Jesus as opposed to pursuing the worldly goals of wealth, honor, and prestige. Ignatian contemplation is praying with the imagination. Ignatius believed that God can speak to us through our imagination. So instead of simply reading scripture or thinking about it, he tells us to use our imagination to place ourselves in biblical scenes. For each of us, this experience differs, which points to a broader principle that is part of the Ignatian spiritual exercises. Ignatius always intended for them to be adapted for each individual based on our different backgrounds and needs. And one of the reasons why the exercises have been so effective for so many people throughout history is that as one prays the exercises, each person experiences them differently. When as a part of my first Ignatian retreat, I contemplated Matthew 4:21 where James and John are mending fishing nets with their father, and Jesus approaches and calls to them 
My experience was deeply informed by the fact that I grew up on the shores of a small Alaskan fishing community. And so I know that mending nets destroys your hands. I learned this by looking at one of my favorite teacher's wrists. After some 20 years of mending her husband's fishing nets, she paid the price for it with carpal tunnel syndrome and surgery that left visible scars at the base of both of her palms. Contemplating this scene, I watched with the eyes of my imagination as James and John immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. If you know anything about the lives of fishing families, you know that they hadn't been sitting around and waiting for Jesus to come. Their hands and backs ached, yet they followed instantly. And in the last chapter of John's Gospel, when the resurrected Christ stands on the beach while James and John fish with Peter in the Sea of Tiberias, calling to them, children, you have no fish, have you? Cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. I imagined what they must have felt when they realized it was him. In contemplating this scene, I will never forget the sound of their nets hitting the water as they threw them down on the other side of the boat, like a sudden downpour of small pebbles upon a glassy surface. But the exercises are more than just these methods. Based on his own spiritual experiences, Ignatius of Loyola designed a retreat in four parts that constitutes the full and complete spiritual exercises. Particular meditations and contemplations are a part of that retreat. But Ignatius didn't intend for people to mechanically run through all of the exercises at the same pace or even in the same order as others. He intended for the exercises to be adapted for each person's needs, temperament, and personal background. So when we think about these adaptations that Ignatius lays out, I think it's helpful to think about layers of adaptations that are involved in any retreat for any given person. The first layer that we want to think about is the retreat layer. So Ignatius, um, in his original sketch of the vision of the exercises, outlines three different retreats what he calls an 18th annotation retreat, a 19th annotation retreat, and a 20th annotation retreat. To get past the cumbersome language there, right? Um, the first of those retreats involves a weekend retreat. Um, and I know here at LMU you have some opportunities for weekend retreats, um, which I would encourage you to take advantage of. It's a great gift being at a Jesuit university as a student or as a staff or faculty member to have those kinds of spiritual resources at your disposal. And that's an opportunity to get a taste of the exercises in shortened form, parts of the exercises, particular um, dimensions of them, particular ways of praying or meditating, but in shortened form. There are two longer retreats that involve engaging the full and complete exercises, all four parts. One of them is an intensive 30-day retreat that all Jesuits make at least twice in their life. Um, but Ignatius also designed a version of that retreat for people like me, who have families, who have jobs, for, for busy people. And that retreat, um, you, you go through the same exercises, but it's made over the course of nine months or a year. And that's the 19th annotation retreat, so designed for busy people. So Ignatius builds into his very kind of retreat system models that, will, that people can plug into depending on where they're at. So he's very sensitive to the differences between different people, their backgrounds, their lives, their needs and desires. He specified that spiritual directors also need to adapt the various exercises, the various parts of the exercises, based on each person's background or temperament. And we might think of that as the personal adaptation layer that's going to be specific to each person. But the exercises are also adapted historically and culturally. So for instance, many who give the exercises today draw upon different images than Ignatius did in his time since we're all shaped by the time and place in which we live. An example would be the meditation on hell, where Ignatius um, is very much a product of his time in envisioning sulfur and smoke when he thinks about hell. But for us, images of hell might involve different things, and we're influenced by contemporary theologians and some of the things we see in the world today um, as images of what hell would look like. What I propose in my book is that one would have an added layer tied to one's religious tradition. Um, in giving the exercises to Christians, of course, spiritual directors for a, for a long time have already made these adaptations for different branches of Christianity. So the exercises are not just given to Catholics, they're given to Protestants um, and Orthodox Christians. Um, and so these kinds of adaptations are already in place. Those adaptations would be much deeper um, if one gives the exercises to members of other religions. 
And when it comes to adapting the exercises for non-Christians, one of the key challenges is certainly that the second, third, and fourth parts of the exercises, or weeks, center on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ presented in the Gospels. Additionally, without question, the exercises center on the idea of a relationship with God. And these are going to be things that are not core parts of many other religions. And so that's a part of what we'll have to grapple with. We can see here the challenge that's presented in Father Nicholas's remarks that he made here. What if you don't believe in God? Or your conception of God differs from the God of the Christian tradition? Can you still benefit from the Ignatian spiritual exercises? So I think a part of what we want to think about is a layer cake, right? And there are some delicious snacks back there. We don't have a Victoria sandwich, right? This is actually a Victoria. Fans of the Brit Great British Baking Show, this is actually Mary Berry's Victoria sandwich, right? So you'll appreciate that. Um, but if you think about each person who makes the exercise sizes, their experience represented by a slice of this delicious cake, right? Um, then the layers of each person's cake really are going to be different. We all have different backgrounds, different temperaments, um, and, and different. there are going to be differences in each retreat, individualized for each person. And that's, that's a core part of the original design of the exercises. You kind of think about those layers of adaptation, and that's what we're going to focus on. <coughs> So, how widely should the exercises be given, and how heavily should they be adapted? That's the question we really have to dig into. There have been a spectrum of responses to this question by Jesuits since Father Nicholas made his remarks, um, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a wide, it's a big spectrum, okay? So, um, a sample from one end of the spectrum um, is Father William Reiser, Holy Cross, um, who has argued that the exercises really should only be given to Christians. And he argues that the spiritual exercises have clear and pronounced Christological parameters and presuppose a certain level of incorporation into the Christian community. He argues that Father Nicholas did not mean giving the full and complete exercises to non-Christians. So there's an interpretive issue here, right? Um, he, that he meant sharing Ignatian spirituality in other ways, in other forms, okay? Since the exercises center on Jesus, Reiser's concern is that they can't be given to members of other faith traditions without removing much of their content. And he actually says he, he worries that we would run the risk of recreating the Jefferson Bible here, right? He really worries about what you'd have to remove, okay? On the other end of the spectrum is Roger Haight, um, who argues that the exercises should be given very widely to non-Christians of all kinds. Um, he especially focuses on seekers, so unaffiliated people. Um, he thinks we should adapt them very liberally. Most significant is that hate recommends for those who do not believe in God, the removal of God from the exercises. Instead, he writes, one might direct the self toward the highest imaginable goal, uniting oneself with what one perceives to be absolute value or enhancing life before ultimate reality. The exercises on his view can and should be adapted to accommodate the beliefs of almost anyone. I seek a middle path in between those two views. I think Riser is mistaken in thinking that the only way to adapt the exercises for members of other faiths is through the removal of large portions of the exercises or by doing what hate proposes. I think hate is mistaken in thinking that one can remain faithful to the aims and purposes of the exercises or retain the integrity and effectiveness of the exercises if one wholly removes God. I also think one misses an opportunity to appreciate the diverse array of contemplative practices in different traditions and to point retreatants toward other well-established contemplative practices that might be a better fat fit for their spiritual needs. And I think Riser and Haight each in different ways prompt us to consider the line between adapting the exercises and innovating new spiritual practices. Both worthy tasks, but different tasks. So if the reason why we wish to share the exercises with those of other faiths is tied to the rich experience that we have had with the exercises, then we ought to be hesitant to go too far down the spectrum in altering the purposes of the exercises. But what are those purposes? Why should we adapt for other traditions? In response to that question, in my book, I examine the text of the spiritual exercises the Jesuit mission as it is conceived in the Constitutions of the Society of Jesus, and a number of other sources, including the more recent documents of the Jesuit General Congregations 34 and 35. The aims are not simply human freedom. Interior freedom on Ignatius' view is thicker. To enable, facilitate, or prepare the ground for an encounter with God. 
that is a direct experience of God. Ignatius invites us into an intimate encounter with God revealed in Jesus Christ so that we can respond more generously to God's call in our lives. In addition to helping souls, a number of the other norms for choice of mission in the Jesuit constitutions are helpful here. For instance, searching for the magis, that is for what exceeds mediocrity and moves towards excellence, going beyond what has already been achieved is worthy of our consideration. The exercises have long been given to Catholics and now are widely given to other Christians as well. They're an extraordinarily powerful way of experiencing the gospel, and this has proven to be true for Christians of many different theological orientations. In what way might Jesuits go beyond in giving the exercises? Giving the exercises to members of other faiths is one way of searching for the magis. The norms for choice of mission are remarkably clear as well, that Jesuits should be moving sometimes to controversial frontiers of action or knowledge, even breaking settled boundaries, and also undertaking works that promise a more universal good and a deeper reach of contact. Giving the exercises to members of other religions is certainly a way of moving beyond settled boundaries and seeking a more universal good by bringing the exercises to new communities. Now, this is a really long quote from Pope Benedict, okay? I have two passages from Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Um, I'm not going to read them in their entirety. Um, but it's important to note that both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis have talked about the importance of Jesuits being on the frontiers, um, working at the, at, the, at the boundaries, right? Being out on the frontiers um, and doing this sort of work and recognizing, as Pope Benedict does here, that the spiritual exercises are at the heart of, of that process and, and represent a very special tool for doing that work. Pope Francis picks up on Benedict's language in many of his remarks. Um, when he talks about what teaching and studying theology means, living on a frontier, um, and the need to meet people where they are, um, and to be embedded in the lives of people wherever they are. And Ignatian adaptation is very much at the heart of what, what Francis, Pope Francis has in mind here when he makes these kinds of remarks. There's a real sensitivity in an Ignatian way um, to meeting people wherever they are on their journeys, and that's so central to adaptation. So based on all of this, why should we adapt the exercises for members of other religions? In addition to these broader answers I give, um, I want to note that your answer, I think, really is going to differ depending on your theological view. Okay? And here, um, this is a diverse audience. Every audience I speak to on this topic is, is considerably diverse. But thinking especially about Christians and thinking about the Jesuits who um, are considering this enterprise and debating about it, um, that's, that's the group that these remarks are directed to in particular. Among the most prominent 20th century approaches to the question of how Christian theology should view other religions are exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. Okay, so I just want to briefly sketch these views. Um, exclusivism involves the view that God is exclusively revealed in Jesus Christ, solus Christus, and though only those who profess Christ who hear the gospel, fide ex auditu, and confess it in their hearts can be saved. Move further down the spectrum um, and you encounter a view called Christian inclusivism, which is the view that Christ is the normative revelation of God, but salvation is possible outside the explicit Christian church, including for some in other religions, though salvation is always from Christ. Further down the spectrum, pluralism, the view that all religions are or can be paths to either the one divine reality or plural divine realities. Christ is one revelation among many different and equally important revelations on that view. Since Christian inclusivists believe that salvation is possible outside the explicit Christian church, and some inclusivists believe that salvation is or may be available through other religions, an inclusivist would justify giving the exercises to members of other religions on the grounds that it will deepen their faith opening them up to a richer relationship with God. But since inclusivists also believe that salvation always comes from Christ because Christ is the normative revelation of God, an inclusivist may also emphasize the significance of the opportunity that the exercises <coughs> provide to encounter Christ directly. Unlike the exclusivist, though, the inclusivist would not, or not necessarily, have conversion as a goal, for this is not necessary for a person's salvation. 
but it's important to distinguish the religious inclusivist position from that of the religious pluralist. Pluralists contend that all religions are or can be equally valid paths to the divine reality. This means that the inclusivist will likely have a stronger pull than the pluralist to give the exercises to members of other faiths. Exclusivists, though, I argue, should support adapting the spiritual exercises for non-Christians because it is a profound way of not just hearing the gospel, but experiencing it in a deeply personal way. An exclusivist who is in favor of offering the exercises to members of other faiths for this reason might emphasize the need to move beyond archaic views concerning conversion and proselytizing. Even the first Jesuits believed this to be true. Juan Alfonso de Polanco, who worked closely with Ignatius on the constitutions, insisted that the exercises were intended for every class of society and in fact helped every class in ways that preaching, exhortation, and fear of damnation did not. So if we have a rich and meaningful way of presenting the gospel and inviting Christ into each person's story, why would we not make it available to all? Indeed, anyone who accepts the view that God is revealed in Jesus Christ should be eager to give others the opportunity to weave their life stories into the story of Christ. For the Society of Jesus, an order that took the name of Jesus simply because knowing, loving, and serving Jesus Christ was the inspiration for their mission, the most powerful justification for this practice is surely found in the Gospels, where Jesus does not turn anyone away, but calls all to follow him, whether rich or poor, old or young. It's appropriate for us to imagine and carefully consider how Jesus would respond to those of other faiths who wish to make the exercises. Would he really turn them away because they're not Christians? I think the next question to consider is who do we adapt the exercises for? Which members of other religions? Um, the exercises are not a great fit for everyone. This is true of Christians, just as it's true of, of, of people of, from different faiths. So I think one of the things that we want to acknowledge um, right off the bat is that, is that someone is going to need to want to pursue some different ends than one pursues in other contemplative practices when one makes the exercises. Um, and is going to want to have a, have a feel for what some of um, the exercises are going to involve in that way. Um, I also think you're going to be look, looking for members of other faiths who are open to and even desire to, and des our desires are very important in Ignatian spirituality to attend to, someone who even desires to encounter God. Um, I do think it's hard to make sense of the exercise's aims without God or the possibility of God. One must also be comfortable with, and indeed have an interest in, encountering and getting acquainted with Jesus. And it's important to remember that the aim is experiential, not intellectual or educational, not to learn about Christianity. They are spiritual, not intellectual exercises. One spends time with Jesus in the exercises. One walks beside him. One accompanies him on mission. One builds a relationship with Jesus as one spends time with him in contemplation. This experience is absolutely central to the exercises. Let me offer an example to underscore just how central accompanying Jesus is to the fruits of the exercises. For all of the impact that they've had on my work, the exercises have impacted me most profoundly as a mother of three young children. The year that I made the exercises was also the year that our son, Patrick, was diagnosed with autism. <clears throat> it pained me when he left his preschool to be placed in a special education program full time. And then one day we attended an event at his school. And bear with me, tears are significant for Ignatius. It's hard for me to tell this story without some tears. As we entered, Patrick took off running toward another child who was standing alone. And smiling, Patrick threw his arms around the little boy and led him toward us, exclaiming, this is my friend Nathaniel. And my eyes came to rest on the severely developmentally disabled child that he embraced. Had I not made the exercises, I would have missed it. But I had spent too much time imagining myself beside Jesus, looking into the eyes of the sick and the disabled to miss the fact that this challenge was transforming my son into someone who really resembled Jesus, proud to claim the other children with disabilities as his friends. 
proud to claim them as his people. It was the experience of walking with Jesus in his ministry as I made the exercises that led me to view my son's disabilities differently. Our whole family has been transformed by this experience. And surely these fruits of the exercises can be shared across religious traditions. So how do we do this? How do we engage in this task of adapting the exercises for people with very different religious outlooks and from different traditions? To begin, the answer will differ for different individuals depending upon their needs and the tradition from which they come. And it's not just a matter of Judaism versus Buddhism and Taoism. Um, it's, we have different <coughs> Jews and different Hindus and different Buddhists and different Taoists or different people who are influenced by those traditions in different ways. I argue that we need to adapt or make changes to the exercises only in order to remove impediments or stumbling blocks. And so I think what we don't want to do is sort of charge into the exercises and say, all right, we're going to have to start by taking these things out and putting these things in. Um, I think you want to start the process of, of working through the exercises, of making the exercises, and see where someone encounters a stumbling block, right? And see where an adaptation is really needed. Often adaptations are not needed in all the places we might initially think. Um, the aim is going to be with the least amount of tampering possible, right? Um, and, and only after having tried to make something work for someone, trying different approaches to meditations and contemplations. Um, this is the same thing that is done in giving the exercises to Christians um, who have really different responses to contemplations and meditations as well. Um, I also argue that it will be helpful in many cases to add readings and stories and images from different traditions as needed for people um, to make certain stories and figures a little more relatable. And there we wouldn't be replacing, we would be adding and augmenting, adding to the exercises. Okay. Um, again, this is true. I think this is something that we see when the exercises are adapted um, for Christians. Um, and, and so to tell, kind of a, give a brief illustration of that, um, so this is Henry Asawa Tanner's The Annunciation, um, a very striking image of Jesus' mother, Mary, um, and The Annunciation, where she encounters God initially. Um, when I made the exercises, um, one of the really big stumbling blocks that I encountered initially was um, the triple colloquy in the exercises, which involves, a part of that prayer, um, involves addressing Mary in prayer. Coming from a Protestant background, addressing a prayer to Mary was a new experience for me and struck me as odd. And so I went into my spiritual director that week and I said, I, I wasn't able to do this. I tried. It just didn't. I, I, I'm, this, is, this is a new thing. I'm not sure. And he said, well, do you feel like this is, you know, like, like you shouldn't do it? Does it feel? I said, well, everything about the exercises has really worked for me. I've had this amazing retreat so far, um, so I'd like to try this. Um, but I'm not quite sure how. And he said, well, let's take a walk. And we walked down the hall, and he led me to a print of this painting um, and invited me in the coming week, as I tried the triple colloquy again, to think about this image and to look at this image of Mary and to consider more carefully what her experience might have been like and considered in a really bare and honest way. And as I did that, this image and the addition of this image to my retreat enabled me um, to really begin to, to build a relationship with Mary. And it became a, a core and, and profound part of my experience of the exercises. Um, and that relationship remains very important for me today in my spiritual life. Um, and that's an example of finding a way to overcome a stumbling block. I had another good friend who made the exercises. Um, also a staff member at Georgetown. And he comes from, he's also a Protestant, comes from the Pentecostal tradition, had the same response uh, to the triple colloquy that I did. I've never prayed to Mary before. What is this? How do I do this, right? Um, but he, when his, his spiritual director, again, tried to encourage him and tried some different approaches, and it really just seemed and felt very foreign to him, and he just couldn't get there. So his spiritual director suggested instead of, of, of praying the triple colloquy, um, including Mary, to pray it using the Holy Spirit. It was a central part of the Holy Trinity, central figure for Pentecostal Christians. And that adaptation allowed my friend to pray the triple colloquy, 
and to remain faithful to that process, that part of the exercises, but in a way that felt fruitful to him spiritually and that felt more natural to him spiritually. So I think these are models of the kinds of adaptations that can be used and that are used by spiritual directors already in the exercises that I think we can apply to different traditions. Now when we turn to other traditions, like the Taoist tradition, obviously we encounter a, a wider range of challenges than when we're talking about different Christians and the diversity within Christian traditions. So one of the reasons that I focus, especially in my book, on adaptations from Asian traditions is that in addition to my own expertise, I think they represent some of the most challenging cases of adaptation because you have very, very different traditions, um, many of which are not even clearly theistic um, in sort of the standard sense that we tend to mean. So in the case of the Taoist tradition, for example, and, and I hope, um, I think, and I hope that many of you have studied this text with Professor Wong. If you haven't, then please take her class um, because you'll have an opportunity to study really with one of the most fantastic professors of Chinese philosophy. Um, and she's a phenomenal scholar of this text. And this text is easily, easily one of the most powerful religious texts um, and philosophical texts that we have in, in, in human history. And so I really want to encourage you to look closely at it. Um, and, and, and consider studying it. Um, but this is a tradition, if you look at this text, that, that where we don't find a clear version of theism, okay? And if you look at the passage here, this is just one chapter, part of one chapter. How expansive is the great way, the Tao, flowing to the left and to the right. The myriad creatures rely on it for life, and thus, it, and it turns none of them away. When its work is done, it claims no merit. It clothes and nourishes the myriad creatures, but does not lord it over them. So one of the intriguing things about the Tao Te Ching is that the language used to describe the Tao um, is sometimes impersonal and sometimes personal language, right? And so even in a passage like this, we have language, very impersonal language, flowing to the left and to the right. Um, but we also have some very personal language, right? It clothes and nourishes the myriad creatures like a loving parent, like a loving mother, as other chapters tell us. Even this language is not totally impersonal in its description of the Tao. The Taoist tradition also focuses on the limits of language when talking about the Tao. And you have the same sort of thing in the apophatic tradition in Christianity. Um, and and there, there are deep and important resonances there um, that are worth noting. Um, that I think you know, would, would prove to be points of understanding and access for members of the Taoist tradition. Taoism today, and if you think about people who identify with the Taoist tradition, who frequent Taoist temples, um, you do have primarily a theistic tradition that looks quite different from those ancient texts like the text of the Tao Te Ching. You have a, t a tradition that is um, a certain form of polytheism. Um, with a great variety of deities. Um, here you see the goddess Madzu, um, who is the guardian of fishermen in particular, but all, protects all those who are on the sea, one of the most popular deities in southeastern China, um, where I've conducted a lot of my research. Um, Matsu has a, has a particular story um, and was a young woman who grew up and exhibited special spiritual abilities um, and special qualities and cultivated those abilities. Um, and worked at tapping into her spiritual life and helping others through her spiritual abilities. Um, after she died, people began to have visions of her and began to report seeing her on the water. And if you visit Matsu temples in southeastern China, you'll see marvelous paintings such as this one depicting many of those stories and scenes that are told and retold um, by devotees of, of Matsu and in, in, in Taoist temples. Um, this particular story here um, features the very prominent Chinese explorer Zheng He, um, who was actually a Muslim um, and uh, had a vision of Matsu when his ship was in trouble. Um, and as a result, um, he became devoted to Matsu. And when, whenever I teach about Matsu in my Chinese religions course, my students say, did he convert? He converted? He wasn't a Muslim anymore? And I say, well, that's not really how things worked, right? Um, and, and indeed, there is something to note here. Um, East Asian forms of theism tend not to be exclusivistic in the way that many Western forms of theism are. 
Um, there is a considerable openness to different traditions and to what we call syncretism, the drawing upon different traditions and in different ways, um, very actively in one's spiritual and religious life. Sometimes that means frequenting different temples, a Buddhist temple, a Taoist temple, a Confucian temple. Um, religious experience is also taken very seriously in this tradition. And you see that in the story of Matsu herself, um, cultivating her own spiritual experiences based on the religious experiences um, she had, her spiritual abilities, um, and also um, in the case of Zheng He, um, who believed that, that, that his vision was real um, and his life was, was changed and his spiritual practices were changed as a result of that. So I think there's some interesting precedents in the Taoist tradition to draw upon in adaptations and engagement with that tradition. When we turn to the Buddhist tradition, um, you have sort of a, a similar um, division of, of, of kind of two families of Buddhists, if you, if you will. And in my book, I outline two different kinds of retreats for two different kinds of Buddhists. Um, most Buddhists in the world today are, are theists. Um, they uh, venerate multiple deities, often bodhisattvas. Um, and, and so that, that you're going to need a certain kind of adaptation there. Um, one of the things that I suggest for theistic Buddhists is the use of, when, when one encounters stumbling blocks, is, is the use of, of what we might think of as sort of bridge deities. And this would involve um, when, a, when a Christian figure strikes one as very foreign um, and difficult to sort of get acquainted with initially, um, one should be invited to think about figures from one's own tradition. Um, the aim is to help them <coughs> access stories and figures that are at the center of the exercises, not to replace them. Um, but building a relationship is a process. It happens in stages. It happens slowly over time. This is true in human relationships um, as well. And so I think we want to use a person's tradition um, and their existing relationships um, as a bridge there. And, and we're really going to be drawing upon a precedent that was set by Jesuits like Matteo Ricci, um, who in, in working in East Asia and in China in particular, in encountering the Bodhisattva Guan Yin, um, by far the most popular Buddhist deity in China, um, there, was a, there was a recognition that, that there, are, there are resemblances between the Bodhisattva Guan Yin and Mary as figures in these respective traditions. Um, and that was a dialogue point um, for Jesuits in thinking about Buddhism and for Buddhists um, in thinking about and being introduced to the Christian tradition. Um, and so I think we want to think about where those bridges lie, not as replacements, um, but as bridges that might open one up um, to new spiritual horizons. The second type of adaptation that I talk about um, mm -hmm. is for what I term philosophical Buddhists, right? Um, this represents a lot of American Buddhists, uh, most Zen Buddhists. Um, and in this case, what we have is a kind of Buddhism that is really not theistic. Um, meditative practices usually um, center on um, experiencing firsthand certain philosophical views in the Buddhist tradition, such as the fundamental emptiness of all things. I do think that this represents the most challenging case of adaptation um, because there is no experience of a deity that one is going to draw upon. Um, and so a couple of things here. I, I think one resource that already exists for us in the Ignatian tradition is the imagination. Um, and I think what, what you're going to want from a philosophical Buddhist here um, is for them to use their imagination and imagine that God exists and consider what that looks like and what that feels like as they make the exercises, right? So there's going to have to be an opening, openness to encounter. That's drawing upon Ignatius's own view and his own um, method and his own approach to spirituality, to use the imagination. Along those same lines, I think it may be helpful to consider a kind of Pascalian wager. Um, and, and this involves this question, what if it's true, right? Um, and, and, and kind of taking that view that, that you imagine that God exists and you, and you wager yes. You say, yeah, God exists. What does that feel like to me? What does that look like in my life? Um, I think from non-theists, there's going to need to be a willingness to do that, to take that step. Um, as one um, experiences the exercises. And so I think those are a couple ways of, of kind of thinking about um, what that's going to look like. Um, a couple of cautions, and here I have this marvelous image of Lao Tzu from uh, southeastern China here. 
um, the founding, sort of the, the central figure in, in the Taoist tradition. Um, I think there's a tendency to want to replace um, figures from the exercises and parts of the exercises um, as opposed to using figures as bridges. Um, I really argue um, against heavier forms of adaptation, removing entire elements, meditations or contemplations, um, um, unless it's absolutely, unless there's really a serious stumbling block. I think generally we want to avoid that and be optimistic about the person's ability to move through the exercises. Um, so first of all, I'm a pluralist when it comes to contemplative practices. Um, as a specialist in Asian traditions, um, I know very well the incredibly rich and diverse array of practices and retreats that exist. Um, and I really think we need to be ready to point people toward the resources that will most help them. And I think this is faithful to helping souls. Um, spiritual directors, I think, already exercise caution in determining whether whether Christians are ready to make the exercise, the full exercises, whether they're a good fit for someone, and I think we have to continue to do that for other people as well. Um, I also um, want to address this, what I would call a search and replace approach <laughs> to the exercises. Um, the assumption behind that kind of approach is that all traditions basically attend to the same themes, um, and thus other traditions have replacement resources, that they're sort of interchangeable, okay? Um, I don't think that's the case, right? I don't think one can find all the same themes in different traditions, certainly those that are central to the exercises in the scriptures of different faith traditions, nor can one find sages, prophets, or messiahs that closely resemble Jesus enough to stand in effectively for him in a heavily adapted version of the exercises. While I think one could find some replacement scriptures or in the sacred texts of, of the Taoist tradition, the Buddhist tradition, Confucianism, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, um, I don't think one could find all or even most of the needed texts in any of them. Their sacred texts simply don't, they don't say the same things in different ways. They say some of the same things, sometimes in the same way, sometimes in a different way, but they also say some very different things. Some of the themes that are central to Christianity as Ignatius presents it in the exercises are not found in other faith traditions. Some features of Jesus's life and teachings are genuinely unique when we compare him with important figures from other traditions. And what we can say specifically about these matters differs in the case of, case of each tradition and also within each tradition and the diversity of texts and figures that are part of different traditions. Another caution um, I think it's important to distinguish between adaptation of the exercises and innovating new practices that are inspired by the exercises. I think we want to be clear about that difference. And in the last chapter of my book, I explore an alternative to adapting the exercises, the invention or innovation of new practices that are inspired by and draw upon the Ignatian spiritual exercises. I do think this is one of the things that Father Nicholas had in mind in addition to the adaptation of the exercises. And I think it's an important additional way of sharing the spiritual exercises more widely. The Confucian tradition, which has extraordinary cultural influence in East Asia today, but which is not a living tradition in the same sense as, say, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, is a fascinating candidate for this type of project since most traditional Confucian spiritual practices have not survived. To conclude my lecture today, I'd like to invite you to join me in trying one of the Ignatian Confucian spiritual ex exercises that I propose in my book. This exercise is inspired by two different forms of prayer from the Ignatian spiritual exercises, contemplation and colloquy. Contemplation, as we've seen, involves using one's imagination to place oneself in a setting from the Gospels or a scene proposed by Ignatius in the exercises. The other form of Ignatian prayer that I'll draw upon is the colloquy, an intimate conversation between an individual and God the Father, Jesus, or Mary, in which we speak very openly and freely and from the heart. In addition to speaking, however, we also leave times of silence for listening. Consider the following line from the classic of filial piety. Remember the ancestors, cultivate their virtue. The Analects describes Kongzi, Confucius, 
observing the rituals that were followed prior to sacrificing to one's ancestral spirits. These included thinking about the deceased, what they looked like, the sound of their voice, the things they enjoyed, out of a belief that contemplating the emotional life of the deceased deepened their devotion and filial piety toward their ancestors. Some also believed that those who properly observed pre-sacrificial vigils would be able to see and hear the ancestral spirit to whom they were sacrificing. Kongza and other Confucians thought that the act of reflecting on one's ancestors, their challenges and joys, their virtues and vices, and considering how they serve as examples for us to learn from as we strive to become better people can actually help us to become better people. And so I, I ask you to choose one of your grandparents or great-grandparents or another relative or ancestor who is no longer alive. And I want to invite you to close your eyes for this exercise. Now think about the individual that you have chosen to focus on. Imagine the sound of their voice, their appearance, their favorite places, their favorite activities. Name their virtues. And recall in your mind the stories that illustrate those virtues. Imagine that they are sitting next to you. What would you like to ask them? What advice or counsel might they offer you? When you're ready, you can open your eyes. So it's important to note that this exercise could be used by those of very diverse religious outlooks, as well as those who don't identify with a religious tradition. While it is a contemplative practice that draws upon the Ignatian tradition in order to cultivate Confucian virtues and values, it's not rooted in or exclusive to a particular tradition. One doesn't need to have a particular metaphysical view or religious view in order for it to be helpful. This makes it very unlike the majority of contemplative practices from the Buddhist, Hindu, or Christian traditions. And this also makes it unlike the Ignatian spiritual exercises, even though it appropriates Ignatian methods. In addition, this exercise departs from traditional forms of religious practice, such as ancestor veneration in East Asian cultures. One is not attempting to contact the spirits of one's ancestors when one makes this exercise, nor is one worshiping them. Um, indeed, one doesn't even need to believe that they exist as spirits. Rather, the aim of this contemplative practice is to facilitate moral self-cultivation through the use of one's imagination and through reflection on the example of the lives of one's ancestors. What we have here, then, is a moral practice which draws creatively upon and is partly inspired by religious practices, 
both the methods of Ignatian spirituality and certain dimensions of Confucian ancestor veneration and moral self-cultivation. This offers us one way of reimagining Confucianism, which makes its rich ethical resources accessible to those of diverse beliefs and walks of life, while also taking seriously the Confucian commitment to the role our ancestors ought to play in helping us to lead happier, more fulfilling, ethically better lives. We can also see from this, exercises, from this exercise another way in which the fruits of the Ignatian spiritual exercises can be shared with members of other traditions in addition to adaptation. I want to conclude um, by reading to you some of the lines from a hymn written by Sidney Carter. And in his inspiration for writing these lyrics, um, he, was, he was inspired partly by the life of Jesus, which is clear from the lyrics, um, but partly uh, also by the statue of the Hindu god Shiva dancing. I danced in the morning when the world was young. I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun. Then I came down from heaven and danced on the earth. I danced for the scribes and the Pharisees. They would not dance. They would not follow me. Then I danced for the fishermen, for James and John. They came with me and the dance went on. Dance then wherever you may be, for I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Thank you. Thank you very much. So beautiful. And it's very... So now, like, open to the floor and uh, for the questions. Yes. I think it's yourself. Loud. Um, I think you said that there was a theistic element or an openness to theism that was required for these exercises. Like, that's why the non-theistic Buddhists had to do uh, the Pascal Wager thing. Mm -hmm. But where was that element, would you say, in the exercise that we did together um, with the ancestor? Uh, the, the Confucian one. Yeah. Why, was, why would that be required? Yeah. For that one? So it wouldn't be required for, for reimagining and imagining new and innovating new practices that would draw creatively upon Ignatian methods, right? Um, it would, a non theist would need to be open to theism um, in order to make the exercises, the full and complete exercises. If we're engaged in that second task of um, drawing upon Ignatian methods in, in, in contemplative practice, that wouldn't be necessary at all, right? It would be kind of a different kind of endeavor. Yeah. I was thinking, is yeah. that one of the first slides where you showed the yoga and how it had been secularized? And mm -hmm. There's a lot of practices of peace, a lot of problems with that. That yeah. was in my mind. Too. Yeah. Yep, that's right. So there's an interesting question about how much, how much theological content you want to strip away from contemplative practices. And um, I think. So many people like in the US are not aware that that process of stripping away the theological content of some of these Asian contemplative practices have not been uncontroversial for members of those traditions um, in many parts of the world. Um, that's, that's, that's been a real concern um, for, for some, right? And so it's, and it's a difficult, I mean, you can see it's a difficult issue, right? Um, and there's, there's some of the same questions of adaptation that come up there. Yes. I have a question about uh, the recommendations for prayer that Ignatius has in the back of the exercises. One of them is he calls it prayer by breath. The idea is you take a classic prayer like Our Father and you link it up to your breathing and see. And the question basically is uh, about the appropriateness of, of, say, mindfulness practices, which are derived primarily from the East, uh, with uh, Christian spirituality in general or Ignatius spirituality in particular. Because as you probably know, there's a kind of controversy, at least among Christians, as to whether or not that's appropriate. Yeah, there are a number of Jesuits who have done that and who have included um, what um, one of them called um, Christian insight meditation, drawing upon some of, some of the physical practices that are used in other traditions of meditation, drawing upon the breath in particular. And as you're noting, there are resources for that already in the Ignatian tradition, but drawing upon some of that to, to pull those physical practices into Ignatian prayer in order to help individuals.
um, with the practice. And so, I mean, part of what the reality there is that we're we're embodied creatures, right? And so, if we want to think about helping souls and growing spiritually, it often is helpful to engage the body, right? And so, this is why across different contemplative practices, including Christianity, um, you see different poses used for prayer, different postures used for prayer that are different from our sort of ordinary postures. Um, so, a number of Jesuits have drawn upon. Um, especially Buddhist and Hindu forms of meditation and, and following the breath um, in, in sort of um, Ignatian practice, right? Um, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for years, I was involved with the Lily Fellows program. Uh, it's an ecum ecumenical group that and we, we met in Valparaiso University. Um, a, a number of different, it, it was all Christian, but it was ecumenical. Um, many different Christian denominations, and but one time we were all discussing, and it, it would be interdisciplinary too. There'd be theologians, literature people, philosophers, you know, all, all different uh, from all different disciplines, and and the topic was engaging with other religions, like non-Christian religions, like like you're discussing today. And one of the questions that came up one of the puzzles that came up for people, and they, it wasn't resolved that day or that week, was if you're really going to engage, let, let's say you're a non-theist, and you're not just borrowing a, a, a technique, like you just displayed in this last example, but you're really going to go through the spiritual exercises uh, with a kind of, let's imagine that God exists. Um, well, you could do that, but wouldn't it just be like a curiosity and, and not really in any way transformative because you're sort of at a distance and, and it would be the same if a Christian were to engage in, uh, like fully try to get into Taoism, in, into a, uh, and, and not just philosophic Taoism, but but into a religious practice of Taoism, which is non-theistic, could you fully throw yourself into that authentically, earnestly, and and still be yourself? I mean, wouldn't like I, I just anyway? It was a problem that came up. I mean, it seems like it's an interesting thing to do as a kind of cultural curiosity, like travel or something. But in terms of the spiritual exercise, what's the benefit if you're just doing it sort of at arm's distance? Yeah, and and um, it's and, and I think it's very clear that that's not what the exercises are for, right? Um, the the exercises are not they're not even really the best way for someone to learn about the Christian tradition, right? Um, it's a it's experiential. The aims are spiritual, and so so that's why the question of who <laughs> it becomes very very important. Who is a good candidate? And this is true. I mean, this is true of Christians as well. Um, so you know, in our so our retreat programs at Georgetown, we have this year long um, retreat where where um, faculty and staff make the full and complete spiritual exercises. Before one does that, one sits down and spends some time talking with one of our Jesuits. And, um, and the conversation is in order to try to gauge what the person, to use Ignatian language, what is, the, what is the person seeking? What are they desiring? What are their spiritual needs? And are they ready for that really intense experience um, in the most intense form um, that one can experience the exercises? Are they, are they ready for that? Are they a good candidate for that? Is that really kind of meeting them where they are? Um, and that's a, that's a question that's taken very seriously in relation, in relation to giving the exercises around the world in different settings. Um, so, so it's absolutely the case that that, yeah, that question has to be central. I do think it's the case um, for a non-theist who feels drawn to the exercises and who wants to make the exercises. A part of what you're going to want to do is to educate them about what they're getting into, right? So members of other traditions need to have some sense of what waters they're wading into before they're waist deep in the water, right? Um, and so there has to be, and often 18th annotation retreats, weekend retreats, shortened forms of the exercises can be good opportunities for sort of dipping your toes into that water <laughs> and figuring out whether it's really where you feel called and feel feel pulled. I do think it's the case that when we take, for, the, for a majority of non-theistic Buddhists, 
Um, I mean, I, I think the question is going to be, do they feel pulled toward a different kind of religious encounter? And do they feel pulled toward um, engagement with, with the possibility of God, right? I mean, I think one, one needs to feel a desire and a seeking that. So, I mean, I have a number of Buddhist friends who are aware of my work, who have even read my book, who have absolutely no interest in the spiritual exercises because they, they feel very fulfilled in their spiritual practice. Right. Um, and it's not where their beliefs are. It's not where they feel pulled. I do have one Buddhist friend, though, who's a, you know, a Zen practitioner, not a theist, <coughs> but who, who feels a sort of nudging, right? And she and I, we talk sometimes. She has other friends who have been, And there's a kind of nudging there. And, and so she's in a process of discernment, right? And Ignatian spirituality is very much centered around discernment, right? And, and that involves talking with me. It involves in talking, talking with Jesuit friends and others who have made the exercises to, to try to gauge whether this is, whether she needs to follow that and whether that's pushing her towards the exercises. Um, or somewhere else, right? Um, I do think one of the, I mean, one of the things there is that in order for an encounter to be possible, um, one, one has to sort of reach out one's hand, right? Um, and so that's in that, and that's, a, and that's a, it's a messy and difficult process, right? But one that should, those steps should be taken with care, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm glad you were at Valparaiso, by the way. One of my PhD students just took a job there, um, and she does into religious dialogue and works on um, Chinese Catholicism. And so that's, that's amazing that you were there. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. You're undoubtedly familiar with Nostra and Pate, the, the doctrine of the Jesuits, too. Yes. It throws the doors open for Catholics and Christians to find the spirit at work in all of these religions and, and not just study it, but participate where there's truth there. Participate. It's not. Yes. Yes, that's right. And so and that is in my book. That is one of the documents that I draw upon from Vatican II, actually, in talking about how is this actually a core part of the call and answering the call of Vatican II. Um, and that's absolutely right. Um, the church has been very clear on what some of the, um, what, what we're being called to do, right? And I do see this enterprise, this, this process of adaptation as a part of responding to exactly that. That's right. There are a number of sources that are important in that. Uh, building, using bridges, but not replacement, okay? And in the spiritual exercise, it's very texture-based, scripture-based, but then it seems to be very a great temptation going to using traditional texts and other traditions, like, you know, Tao Te Ching, the Analect, or, you know, very colorful story from Mencius. Is that a big bridge, or is that a replacement? I think one of the first, yeah, I think one of the first questions is where is someone encountering difficulty? Where is someone encountering um, uh, a stumbling block in the exercises? I mean, I think initially you, I mean, so, I mean, as Ignatius says, the spiritual director is really supposed to try to get themselves out of the way <laughs> so that God can work directly with the individual, so that there's a direct encounter in the exercises, right? Um, so I think um, Part of what we want to do is avoid sort of um, inserting ourselves and in, in, in meddling with things where that might not be necessary. So I think you want to allow someone to, in, to, to, to encounter the story, to imagine themselves um, walking on the beach with Jesus and imagine themselves in those scenes and see what happens, right? And I think it's when someone encounters trouble, when, they're, when someone's saying, who, who is this guy? This doesn't feel right, this feels strange to me, and is really struggling to imagine themselves in that scene and to get there. Um, I think that's the point at which one might draw upon stories um, from one's own tradition. One might draw upon a story of the historical Buddha. One might draw upon a story of Krishna. And I, and I talk some, I give some examples of that what stories exactly are going to vary widely for different individuals, depending upon which branches of Buddhism or Hinduism they're from, which texts and stories they know and feel at home with, which, which texts and stories and figures are important in their own spiritual practice and their own life. Um, so there's going to be a lot of room for adaptation that's going to be needed there. But I think it's only when one would encounter a stumbling block that one might say, okay, let's, let's think about a story from your own tradition. Let's think about, you know, and then not as a replacement for the story. I think one allows the individual to use Ignatian methods to imagine oneself in that story, imagine oneself with those figures, 
and then you come back to the story, right? And you revisit it. So, and, and that's, and again, this is something that spiritual directors working with Christians um, really do quite a lot in adapting the exercises for people. And so I think we can kind of extend what Jesuits are already doing and what those in Jesuit circles are already doing to members of other traditions. But I do think it's important to use it as a bridge and to come back then um, to the stories from the Gospels, to come back to the scenes that Ignatius envisions. If individuals encounter repeatedly difficulty doing that um, and aren't able to come back, and I do think there's a need for discernment on the part of the spiritual director and the person as to whether this is the right set of practices, whether this is the right retreat. Um, and, and of course, this, this happens with the spiritual exercises um, when, when they're given to Christians as well. So in my cohort, when I first made the exercises, um, there was one member of our group who, you know, he did the, he, um, he made the first week of the exercises and he really, and then he, he stopped. Um, and, and didn't go further. And that was, um, that was, it just wasn't, it wasn't where he was supposed to be, right? It wasn't, it was difficult for him to get past some stumbling blocks um, and, and he didn't continue. And that's, and that's not a failure, right? That's, that's where, where someone is. But it is why you do, there, there should be a process of discernment before someone starts, right? Kind of thinking about, this is what this involves. These are the kinds of stories um, and getting a feel for it before one begins, before one embarks on that journey. And at least, and if you're non Judeo Christian or uh, Islamic tradition, if they're not in that tradition, those three traditions, that's must be like earlier you mentioned, there's that openness of encounter to that divine being or even accompany Jesus. Yes. You need to have in order to put this to work. Yes, yeah, I think there has to be, an, there has to be an openness to that. Um, and, and, and to use Ignatian language, it's, you know, what is, what is the person seeking? What are they desiring? You know, um, you know, and to use the words of Jesus, you know, what are you looking for, right? Um, that's, that's really important to attend to in that process. Um, but, you know, a big part of my work um, as I worked on the book was, was spending time with, with Jesuits and others in Jesuit circles all around the world, um, in the U.S. and all around the world as well, who give the exercises to different kinds of individuals. Um, and I think one of the fascinating things about the spiritual exercises um, is that the exercises really operate with, with quite what I would call a, a pretty thin theology um, in that you, you imagine yourself beside Jesus, right? And you're looking into these people's eyes as you walk with him, right? Um, you're feeling what he feels with his hands as he's, as he's reaching out to touch them. Um, and and that's, what, that's the journey. Right, that's the, it's an experiential journey, and I think um, I, I do think it's it's quite impressive how many people that is that is very possible for right, um, and how many people actually don't encounter um, the kinds of stumbling blocks one might imagine, right? Um, now, for certain people, I mean, you're you're going to have I mean, you're going to have the resurrection of Christ, right? You're going to have some things that are that are um, robust, but again. You're, you're walking down that road, right? You're there, you're witnessing it. You're asked to be present, to be there. Um, and even for Christians making the exercises, spiritual directors typically ask individuals to, as, as big theological questions, kind of the thick theology comes up, individuals are asked, okay, we're gonna bracket that question, right? We're gonna bracket the question about the divinity of Jesus. How can he be a man and God, <laughs> right? You're asked to bracket those questions in order to walk down the road with Jesus in order to have the experience, right? And, and my spiritual director even said that to me at certain points in the exercises where I said, well, I just can't figure this out theologically. How would this, how does it, and he said, we're gonna explore that after you've finished the retreat, right? There will be lots of time, right? Um, but right now, you're, you're, you're on this journey, right? Be present, witness it. Be, you know, imagine yourself there, be, be present. Work on that relationship and that experience. And I think that that is, I, I think that's much more accessible for, for members of other tradition than we might at first think. Yeah. Sorry to ask a second question, but yeah. um, <coughs> I, you, you've said a couple of times that in order to, prior to engaging in the, in the exercises, you should you know, discern whether or not you're really prepared or whether it it's, would be suitable for you. 
Um, it seems like one of the main questions for a Christian or a non-Christian, or a theist or a non-theist, would be, what is the aim? Why am I doing this? But what's the point? Now, I know when I did it, the point for me was to get closer, closer to Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. to learn more about him, and to actually be, you know, have the spiritual uh, depth and awakening to get to know him better as part of my own life. So, but I'm a Catholic, you know, I mean, so it was like that was consonant with everything. Um, it seems like, like what is the aim of it mm -hmm. for someone who is a non-theist or a non-Christian? Um, is it moral uh, development or psychological healing? Yeah. This is a great question, and in many ways, this is the question that's at the very heart of my book. I spend, I spend a lot of time on this question because it's so important, right? Um, and so the answer is no, it's not just for moral development. I mean, the aims, I think, part of what we have to look at is what are, what are, what are the aims and purposes of the exercises, really, right? Um, and there are multiple things one can say about that because Ignatius himself says multiple things about that. And multiple aims and purposes have been a part of the exercises throughout their history, right? Um, but, but the overarching aim um, is, is, um, is a, it's, it's about a relationship with God, right? And it's about a relationship with Jesus, right? And so certainly the aims for members of, of the Christian tradition as well as for members of other tradition, for anyone who makes the exercises, is to grow spiritually um, and to provide an opportunity for an individual um, to have an, a direct encounter with God. Um, one aspect of the exercises that is very important throughout its history and that, that Ignatius is very clear on is that, that we are, are not supposed to be too heavy-handed in specifying agendas and aims and purposes for particular individuals, right? And so Ignatius really stresses the importance of allowing the creator to deal directly with the person. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think there are things that we say about, okay, how, how do we understand what we're doing with the exercises? Well, the exercises are about spiritual growth. They're about direct encounter, right? And you can see that in Ignatius's response to that very issue. Um, but what I, one of the things I think in order to be faithful to what Ignatius envisions of the exercises and to be faithful to everything he says in the history of the practice of giving the exercises, I think we don't want to go and specify a bunch of, a sort of a, a, a bunch of aims um, outside of that, of what we see there, right? Um, and so, I mean, I think the outcomes for different people who make the exercises are really different, right? Um, and so some people have um, really transformative experiences. Um, for other people, you know, it, it, their experiences, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting, it doesn't, it's, it's not as transformed, right? Um, and, I, and I think um, there, we don't, want to, we don't want to be too heavy-handed in sort of judging, well, this is a success, this is a failure, this person shouldn't have done it, right? Um, because again, I mean, that's, you, you want to allow the creator to deal with the person, the creation, directly, right? Um, and that's right at the heart of Ignatian spirituality. Um, but certainly, religious experience and direct encounter and building a relationship is, is at the heart of the exercises and what, and what they're about. Okay. Thanks for your talk. Um, you said a little bit more about this in the book, but you really haven't said much about it today. And I wonder if you would uh, reflect a little bit more about the one of the other sort of purposes built into the exercises, which is discernment and, mm -hmm. and the election. Ultimately, that's part of that there. And how do you how do you see that as part of the possibility for adaptation? There is, of course, the part of having a deeper encounter with Jesus Christ and growing in in a very relational way um, uh, with God. But then there's this. This sort of other piece too, right? Uh, what strikes me as, in some ways, providing another entry point for thinking about adaptation. That there is a uh, another this is not the word I'm looking for, but sort of more practical um, aim to the exercises as well, which is to to really learn how to make decisions through growth in one's relationship with God. That, that strikes me as a place where there's room to also think about how other other faith traditions. Absolutely, and I, and I think that one of the, the resources for discernment in the Ignatian tradition are, I think, resources um, that, that, that are worth looking at um, over and apart from the full retreat in terms of how can we offer those 
um, to people from different traditions, right? Um, now, the challenge of that process, of course, is that Ignatian discernment involves discerning how God is leading you and, and sorting through one's desires um, and sorting out disordered desires and figuring out, you know, um, and that process of sifting through, right? And so um, in adaptation, then you have this question, okay, what does one do then with someone who doesn't believe that God, <laughs> in God right? Um, and so you have some of the same, I mean, I think in order to really access, you know, Ignatian discernment, um, in the fullest sense, one would need an openness to the idea of a God who calls us in different ways and who leads us in different ways and to kind of following what Ignatius is going to have us do um, in sorting that out, right? From a Buddhist perspective, I will say, from the standpoint of philosophical Buddhists, and I talk some about this in the book, um, this becomes challenging because desires um, are at the root of the problem, right? And so, I mean, for a philosophical Buddhist, there would have to be an openness to considering desires in a very different light. And I think, again, I think realistically, the kind of person we'd be talking about is someone who's looking beyond the Buddhist tradition and who's wondering whether this is their, their spiritual home or not, right? I mean, I think that's why someone's gonna be drawn um, to another set of practices, realistically. Um, I do think, though, one, one, a, a different task than that um, would be to take some of the resources of Ignatian discernment um, and reimagine them in relation to some different traditions. And then that would, but that would, that would be a different task than, than kind of sharing Ignatian discernment, but one that I think would be worthwhile, right? I think there are elements of Ignatian discernment, like that, for example, in my students' lives, I would, I would like for my students to do some of those things, partly because it involves slowing down and turning inward and closely examining what your motivations really are in all of their complexity and looking hard at them slowly <laughs> over time and in conversation with, uh, with trusted other people, right? Um, and I think some of that can be made accessible to people with different theological outlooks. Yeah, that clearly the, the notion of the sort of positive version of desire that's a part of the spirituality uh, could certainly be a stumbling block, but the, the notion of, of becoming more attentive to our own disordered attachments and desires um, certainly would have great resonance with Buddhism. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, so, how do you use the idea of purpose for both of which is positive? Um, are we looking at this as kind of more of an evangelical side of things that we're out to kind of bring people to God? Or is the concern more of a kind of stronger, more pervasive spiritual path? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, so when I first started working on this project and I started talking with different Jesuits um, about this enterprise, I said to one of them, who's a very prominent Jesuit, who's worked a lot on the exercises, and I said to him, well, what would be the goal of, of this then, right? It would be to convert people, right? And he said, no, no, <laughs> the goal is not to convert people. He was really adamant in that. Um, and, and, and this is a Jesuit I've continued to kind of dialogue and come back and dialogue as I worked on this project. Um, I think some of this depends on one's spiritual outlook, one's religious outlook, and this is why I think we can think about exclusivists, inclusivists, pluralists. I think for an overwhelming majority of Jesuits and those in Jesuit circles, I think that's absolutely not um, sort of the aim, right, um, in terms of where they're coming from theologically because they're coming from a, an inclusivistic sort of perspective or a pluralistic perspective. Um, but I will say this about that. I think the truth is that the best answer is that we really shouldn't have a specific aim other than to um, open up a person's um, experience to the possibility of an encounter with God. Um, I think that's, that's, you know, about as far as we should go, right? Um, and, and again, in order to try to be faithful to Ignatius' conviction that we ought to allow God to deal directly with um, the person, I think um, we really shouldn't have an agenda, right? Now, theologically, you know, some people would like to see all people become Christians. Others don't think so, right? That's, they're going to see a real range. Um, I think that there are theological justifications for, for doing this 
all along that theological spectrum, um, no matter how conservative one might be. Um, but, but I don't think we should have particular agendas or aims. I think for some people, I think it, it, it would lead to conversion. For others, it wouldn't, right? I think you'd see a range of outcomes, and I don't think we'd want to judge that and say, here's a success, here's a loss, right? I don't think that's really faithful to the spirit of the exercises. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing that I was thinking about in terms of going back to the, the comment earlier about uh, Nostra Aetate, thinking about this project within the context of, of broader calls um, within the Catholic Church and, and many traditions for increased interfaith dialogue, it strikes me that the exercises are, are a good place for engaging with that because in addition to the kind of thin theology uh, in general, there's a really thin ecclesiology in all of this, right? Church, the big capital C church, is not is not part of this experience in, 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 in that sense. Obviously, there are the rules for thinking of the church, and there's some things for the back of the exercises that, that get us into that. But generally speaking, that focus on on the, the, the kind of mystical um, experience, the relationship between the exorcitant and God, where the director tries to stay out of the way as much as possible, not be a mediating force, but be a kind of a companion on the journey, um, seems to me to clear out some of the challenges around um, interfaith dialogue and conversation that, that church as institution throws in the way of many of these other religious faiths where that kind of institutional piece is simply not there in the same way um, that it is for, for Catholicism, which is arguably the most sort of heavily institutionalized of, of all the major um, faiths. So, so that thin ecclesiology seems to me to be a kind of an advantage of, of using the that's absolutely right. And, and I think you see that in the enormous success in adapting the exercises for different Christians. Um, and even, I mean, I will say, I mean, this is, I've, I've been, it's so interesting, the different conversations. Like I've, I've, I've heard people say, well, it can work for Protestants. It really can, right? You know, like, and, and it's, I mean, I think that's, that's striking for some, but I mean, I just really think it's, it's um, there's just been remarkable, I mean, there's been remarkable success in doing that. Um, and, and I think you see the flexibility of the exercises and you see the thin ecclesiology there, right? Um, and a part of what you see also is the role of adaptation in the life and history of the exercises, right? Where one is certainly making adaptations as one goes on. This is, this is a part of the, giving the exercises actively throughout its whole history from the very beginning. It's not just a modern innovation, right? I mean, there's a there's a, and, and the life of the exercises and how they've been given has changed dramatically as well, right? Um, and you have returned to the sources, you have all of that, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely right. And, and I think that's a very good point, right? You have this, this thin ecclesiology that you can operate with. But yeah, it's about, it's about experience. It's about um, encounter. And it's a different kind of, of interreligious dialogue in that way. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, so you were talking a little bit about a divine reality, or, or I was using like the, the singular form, for like um, or the di divine reality. Um, I think that kind of relates, and myself as like um, a non-theist, I, I don't particularly, but then seeing how well it adapts to pluralism, which I see is um, very close um, to non-theism, where it kind of borrows just many uh, spiritual elements from these. And as a, and as a from fellow non-theist, we grow in acknowledging the importance of spirituality. Do you think that these practices, or I guess another way of saying it would be, do you think a divine reality is necessary in everybody? That might be too broad of a question. Or do you think that um, everyone, I guess, yeah, the way um, it, you're, is that everyone has a different manner to doing it. Do you think non-theists have specific barriers to that? Or do you think these practices could be Use there. Does that make sense? I, I mean, I think if one is a non-theist, then I think one needs to be open to the possibility of God and and kind of and drawn to it, and um, and drawn to that possibility and to entertaining that possibility in a really serious and experiential <laughs> and firsthand encounter sort of way, like not just like theoretically contemplating it, right? You can go read some good philosophy of religion to contemplate that. Um, but, I, you know, but I think you know, if, if one wants to really um, sort of reach out your hand and see if, see if there's um, something that reaches back, um, then I think, that's, I think that's 
uh, uh, the willingness that's that's going to be necessary here. Okay. Yeah. So it was. It's, yeah. Do you think that's kind of like a, okay? That seems similar to the prescription of like secular Buddhism, where it's right when there's a lacking. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. We are so happy.